Uh, welcome to SIG Architecture for Thursday, May 9th, 2019. Uh, the agenda for the meeting you can find at bit.ly slash SIG dash architecture. I'll go ahead and paste the URL in here. And today we've got a few things going. Uh, the first thing I wanted to bring up is that the next meeting in two weeks is during KubeCon EU. And so we're going to go ahead and, and cancel that now. Um, if it's not, I'll go ahead and get it canceled in the calendar here shortly so you don't get any meeting reminders or anything while you're at the conference. Um, and so that's the first thing. The next thing we have up is an update on the triage process. And Brian was going to show us some stuff, which is why today he's ready to screen share and present. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, and we can see your screen. Okay, great. Yeah, the um, have a USB A to USB C adapter that seems a little bit flaky. So uh, anyway, um, yeah. So to, I went through the uh, triage process as a dry run uh, a couple of times and sent out email through the mailing list. I'm just going to go over that live because uh, Dim and some others thought that would be useful. So the general idea of triaging issues is similar to uh, for other projects you've probably worked on. What's a little bit different about SIG architecture is that you know often we don't feel field uh, bug reports like broken tests or features that are broken. We mostly feel uh, feature requests. Uh, but otherwise, the process is the same. The goal of triage is not to fully resolve uh, issues generally, but to figure out how to move them closer to resolution and reduce the work of other people who might stumble across those issues or, or try to help with triage uh, in the future. So I sketched out kind of the process I used or in the past. Um, some things that worked for me, I realized won't work for everyone. Also, some things have changed. So we have some folks in the project who uh, are helping out with triage generally and routing them to SIGs. Uh, also through the Bach commands, even people who aren't members of the org in some cases can uh, suggest SIGs when they file issues. And they may not necessarily know which SIGs are the right ones. So they tend to add lots of SIGs, hoping <laughs> that some of the SIGs will be some of the relevant ones. Uh, so, you know, one of the, I, I was hoping the bot will add needs, SIG, needs, uh, kind, needs, priority, uh, but I didn't actually find any issues uh, that needed those because somebody else had already decided most of those things. Uh, need priority is also not needed for every issue, so that one doesn't show up. So searching for those needs labels turned out not to be useful. Uh, so I just started with, are the things categorized as SIG architecture actually SIG architecture? And do the issues, uh, are the issues clear? Like in particular for me, since I receive zillions of emails and GitHub notifications and other things, I have to decide what to look at from a very small amount of information. So if you look at, um, let's see, uh, let me just look for, SIG architecture, for example, um, and uncheck reliability. Right. So if I look at labels in Kubernetes or issues in Kubernetes, Kubernetes that are labeled SIG architecture, uh, oh, this includes PRs. So let me just make this issues. Um, you know, the, a bunch of them have been triaged and closed, so there are only 35 open, but uh, you know, 35 is still a fair number. If there were hundreds open, it would be really important to be able to decide what to do just based on information in the list view. So we see in the list view is the title and, uh, of the issue. So we ideally, we'd like to be able to decide on the disposition and even change the disposition of the issues just from looking at this list. You know, just check a bunch of things and say, no, remove SIG architecture from these or check a bunch of ones and add the categorization. Is it a bug? Is it cleanup? Or is it a feature? Uh, a lot of things in SIG architecture are cleanup or feature. 
Um, so the first thing I do is I go through this list and look for things to attach. So I actually just start it started at the top um, with the this K log issue. And actually, um, you know, if you look down at my more detailed message, uh, I actually saw a pattern here, which is, hey, there are a bunch of these K log issues. And I remember we discussed K log at previous SIG architecture meetings. Um, but it made me think about, well, does is K, should K log actually be a SIG architecture thing? So and also when bug is to the SIG architecture. Well, yeah. So that's a, that's well, a different question. There probably isn't a SIG that covers K log. Except that there should be. Yeah. So it's logging, so that's SIG instrumentation. So yeah. I actually suggested right here, hey Dems, uh, sh should this be SIG instrumentation? And they made it so. Great. Um, so actually, this should no longer be categorized SIG architecture. Is that right, Dems? Are you on? Can see all the people on. Uh, yes. Uh, we need to move it to SIG instrumentation. Uh, so we can just say, you know, remove SIG architecture. And the bot will make it so. And I actually learned that the bot behavior has changed, so I'm, I have the old habit of just changing the labels directly without the bot commands. That actually doesn't even work. <laughs> so the, the bot actually looks through the history of all the SIG, SIG add SIG and remove SIG commands, uh, and you'll end up fighting with the bot. So definitely use the commands now, <laughs> even if you could in the past change the labels directly because you have write access or admin access to the repo. Um, otherwise, the bot will undo what you did. So the other thing is, once you type commands, uh, a particular problem for me is that GitHub will subscribe me to the issue. Like this used to be true, even if I changed the labels. Hey, hey Brian, one quick thing that I just realized: I think your screen share is still sharing the list view. Did you open it up in a new window and only share the one window? Uh, how about that? There we go. Now we see it. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. For, yeah. Thank you for letting me know. Uh, yeah. So if you change the labels on the side, that used to subscribe also. Uh, it, Gail fix that. It doesn't anymore. But if you use the bot command, it still subscribes to you. So I always now click unsubscribe um, if I don't want to follow the issue going forward, which doesn't help me a lot. That's like one in thirty thousand uh, things I'm subscribed to, but um, it's a good habit to get into <clears throat> for people who are triaging. Otherwise, you'll end up getting dosed by GitHub notifications, like uh, some of us who've been on the project longer. Um, you know, so then moving right along. So finalizing objects are mutable. So I also happen to know what this one is about, um, but uh, you know, I found it interesting. Open it up. Um, I, I comment on on that. So. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Habits, yeah, there, this window has a bunch of tabs. Um, so this one I actually want to be subscribed to, so I commented and subscribed. This one is appropriately SIG architecture. One issue I ran into is that um, SIG network is also on it, and SIG network has a bot that labels things triage unresolved. So thank you to uh, Valerie, I think, for pointing that out. Uh, so I did not remove the triage unresolved, even though I triaged it for SIG architecture. We need to figure out what we want to do about that for multiple different SIGs with multiple different processes. Uh, something else I realized, um, let me go back to uh, inconsistent imports is uh, code. You see it has area code organization. That's actually the code organization subproject. We need to get um, subproject labels so that we can use subproject labels for these things. But right now, it's an area. Um, <clears throat> this issue had already been triaged and ca correctly categorized as part of the code organization subproject. It is actually uh, got it. It is actually also on the project board. So under projects, it says backlog in the code organization project. So the API reviews code organization and conformance efforts all have project boards. So the triage process for those sub projects is to start in uh, some kind of uh, input column like backlog or to be triaged or something like that. It's a little bit different for the different 
project boards, I think. Um, so let's see if I can actually get this in a tab instead. Yeah, so, uh, you know, they, they, here it might start in the backlog column, for example, uh, to get triaged. Here it's at the bottom. So, you know, maybe it will get moved up or maybe it will get moved to another column when somebody's working on it. So the goal of the triage project is to make sure that the uh, it's categorized to the right subproject and that subproject will uh, be able to see it and pick it up with their triage process. So we want to move it from the general cigar architecture pool to the, the correct subproject. Um, right now, there's no good way of looking at this list view and seeing whether it's already in uh, on the radar of the subprojects, whether it's on their project board. Uh, there is work underway to address that. There are a couple of different ways to address it. One is to have labels that correspond to the project boards or just say that it's in some project board. Another way is uh, to have the project boards automatically slurp in uh, issues based on a query. So for example, if we had area code organization, we could just know that that must be on the code organization project board because that project board automatically uh, will slurp in those issues. So that's another thing that we're working on getting resolved. So this other, um, th there's another K log issue, dependency graph for analysis. Um, that's the source dependency uh, graph. I actually opened that and took a look and um, I think, I, I don't remember if it's categorized as code organization or not, but I made sure that it was. Uh, yeah, so I added code organization to that one. Um, <clears throat> so there were some issues that were not SIG architecture. Uh, so in those, I also removed SIG architecture. So for example, there was one about so-called D in the containers, which was actually uh, related, it was an, yet another deferred container-like proposal, uh, which is not SIG architecture specific, so I removed SIG architecture. Uh, some issues had, were labeled rotten by, or stale by Thetabot, so for those I decided whether to remove those labels or, uh, or close them. Um, here's another case where I removed SIG architecture on rebasing to distroless images from uh, BusyBox and Scratch and other things. <clears throat> so in general, you know, just going down this list and making sure that they're categorized to the correct SIGs, they're categorized to the correct subprojects, they're on the, the if they're one of SIG architecture subprojects, it's on their project board, it's correctly categorized as kind, cleanup, or uh, feature requests. Um, also, you know, making sure that the titles are correct uh, and accurate. So this one was interesting. So this title before was, uh, let me see, I think I mentioned this in my you first. scroll down to the bottom of the issue, it'll show what you changed it from. Okay, well, it's also my email. So memory limits at uh, incorrectly set in a Helm chart leads to cluster crash, right? So that was the, the user's specific scenario where they triggered the crash, but reading through it, um, I concluded it was a cascading failure scenario. And I have seen that in other scenarios. So I went tracking down, well, what are the related issues? I also, you know, this was a case where the, the person just added a bunch of SIGs, SIG nodes, SIG architecture, SIG scheduling, SIG cluster lifecycle. And GitHub now uh, helpfully uh, doesn't show it now, but it said, you know, this is the here, open this issue, their first thing at Kubernetes, right? So you can say, well, this is someone new to Kubernetes. I didn't have to search for that like I might have done in the past. Uh, so they weren't really sure how to categorize it. And indeed, you know, cluster lifecycle is not super relevant in this case. So I removed, say, cluster lifecycle uh, using the command. Uh, initially, I tried using the, uh, just doing it with labels and that and found I was fighting the bot. Uh, so, you know, the oldest issue of this flavor uh, was 2529, which I remember. 
Uh, and I happen to know, I happen to remember that this issue was not resolved. <laughs> it was closed, but not resolved by addressing the underlying problem. Uh, it was worked around, so I went chasing down more. Uh, so there have actually been a bunch of these filed over time. Um, this is the oldest one. This is a more recent one, and Jordan helpfully, or this, uh, Wang Ling Hao, um, hopefully chase down a number of other previous and recent ones uh, caused by different cases. Uh, so we're gonna talk more about reliability next, but I spent some time chasing down related issues and decided to, uh, the Zoom thing is getting in my way of my tabs. Uh, <laughs> ah. Let me move this below. I decided to just use this um, this recent one as the umbrella issue for this. Uh, so we'll talk we'll talk about uh, reliability next. But the main point here is I decided what SIGs were relevant. I retitled the issue. Um, we filed an issue, I guess, to get a retitle command since most people people who don't have write permission can't change titles right now. Uh, and wrote a uh, sort of a summary of what I thought the general problem was um, and the other issues and scenarios uh, that were related. So going back to, so at some point I decided, um, you know, going down through this list that I had actually seen all the issues before, uh, they were categorized as SIG architecture, and I stopped uh, looking through them. So we don't have a way of marking those as triage. Also, that tends to bit rot over time, which is sort of the point of data bots, although it creates a lot of noise for me personally. Um, so that will just need to decide what we want the process to be in terms of how to curate the backlog of issues. Uh, but hopefully, you know, if they're all in some relevant subproject board, uh, we can decide are we ever going to do them or should we close them? We should get better at that, and not have a bot just force us to do it. Uh, SIG architecture is actually in good shape compared to many other SIGs like API machinery and Node uh, that have massive backlogs of, of issues. Um, so we're in relatively good shape here. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if it's feasible. Uh, Generally, I tend to lean on the side of keeping it open, although I know Tim went through and, and closed some and said, that realistically, we're never going to do these things. Some are just obvious from the beginning that we're never going to do them. Like there was a recent request uh, to re-architect the entire system from master-slave to peer-to-peer. It's like, yes, thank you for your suggestion, but um, not feasible. Um, there have been there is another recent suggestion of rename service to reverse proxy. Yes, I see the point, but uh, we'll take it into consideration when uh, when and if we redesign the service API. Um, <clears throat> so, in a nutshell, that's the general process. You know, I think for people who want to take a stab at it, I would say uh, don't be afraid. You can, if you're not sure about some specific issue, you can actually ask the author for clarification about what they meant. And that will definitely help uh, anybody else who tries to take a look at it. Uh, if you're not sure, if you have a guess of what the cause might be, but you're not really sure, uh, you can look it up or you can ask others uh, in the community on Slack or in the appropriate SIG mailing lists, like uh, in this cascading failure one, just as an example, uh, th the person said their container zoomed and that caused a cascading failure. So, you know, if you're not really sure, well, what actually happens if a container keeps zooming, uh, you can just do a Google search and find out, right? So I actually did that, um, even though I was pretty confident what the behavior was. Uh, I just Google searched a couple of things like Kubernetes container exceeds memory limit. You know, I happen to know that that causes an oom. You know, so if you're also aware of that, you could also search for Kubernetes oom kill. Um, and I actually just found an example where someone had this exact scenario uh, that showed 
yeah, they started uh, started a container for the status was um killed a few seconds later, it went into crash loop back off. Right. So then the question is, well, if it once it's in crash loop back off, what causes it eventually to get evicted from the node? So we could actually go and back and ask the uh, original issue author, hey, do you happen to know what caused it to get evicted off your node? Um, uh, are you able to reproduce it? I haven't actually done that, but that might be a useful thing to do. I do happen to know that a common case is local disk ends up, fills up eventually due to uh, you know, logs spewing things or uh, containers piling up or all kinds of things. That's not the only failure mode uh, that can happen. And if the container, if the disk fills up, the container runtime can't start any containers. The kubelet will eventually report the runtime is unhealthy and the node will be unhealthy and then the pod will get evicted and, and a new one will get generated by the controller and the scheduler will schedule it somewhere. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, don't be, I guess the point there is don't be afraid to like do some homework, look things up, you learn something, uh, ask for help, uh, point out the issue. If you're not sure which SIG it should land in, uh, you can ping people in other SIGs, either through the GitHub issue, although I hesitate to lie just on GitHub notifications because many people who've been on the project for a long time are in my situation uh, where um, there's too much noise from GitHub notifications. Uh, but you can try one of the other communication channels like uh, Slack or the mailing list or a meeting. Um, does anybody have any questions about what generally we're trying to do with the triage process or how to go about the triage process or um, whether you know it's okay to go change uh, labels or whatnot? Oh, I guess one, one last point. Don't assign anyone to an issue unless they agree uh, to be assigned because some people won't even notice that they're assigned. And if the issue is assigned, then other people will tend not to work on it or look at it. Um, and that's actually some a signal we want to enable so that not everybody looks at everything. That's a waste of time. Uh, you can CC people instead. Yeah. Yeah, you can you can CC people instead. You you can sorry like as somebody who shares Brian's problem of having too too many things, I don't see anything that's CC to me. I yeah, can literally it goes straight to my archive in my Gmail. I only see things that are directly assigned to me in the Kubernetes Kubernetes repo. Yeah, and it also alternates whether searching for mentions even works or not for some of us. Yeah, yeah, that's broken. You, usually, it just five of three. I, I mentioned the yeah. CC in, in APM machinery when we triage. Uh, People often want somebody not necessarily to like do the thing described in the issue, but like watch it and see if something happens in the UCC. I mean, for, for that, what I what I I don't know. I feel like I I really want something in between mentioned and assigned from GitHub's point of view, um, like consulted or something. Yeah, um, but I'm not sure that, that would actually be any different than mentioned. Yeah, yeah. By the way, if anybody is typing anything in chat, I can't see it. So. Uh, I I basically said I agreed with Tim and I said CC goes to dev null. Yeah. All it's not that it goes to dev null. I, I save them all in my archive yeah. so that when it inevitably gets assigned to me, I have the whole history of it in my mailbox. Yeah. But yeah, I don't see them by default. And I, I like just anecdotally, I went through SIG network triage last night and I did about a hundred bugs, many of which were open three years ago and have activity in the last two weeks. Uh, and it was like specifically people asking me for input where I'd never seen them. And it's really bad. I don't really know how to break that. Yeah. Tim, uh, that, that sort of thing has occurred to me. And it seems like different people have different methods of managing their uh, information overload. And uh, do we have anything written down somewhere that says, if you want to you know, uh, get people's attention in the following ways, this is the standard way of doing it? Because otherwise, you know, everybody seems to, you know, Brian says he never reads these things and somebody else says they never read those things and somebody else says, please assign to me and somebody else says never assign to me because I don't see it. Is it reasonable to try and standardize that and say this is good ways of doing it and these are bad ways? So for, I have an answer, which is for SIG architecture, uh, we advise the mailing list because I don't read Slack either unless I'm explicitly notified and then only at the end of the day after I'm out of meetings. But, but that's you personally, Brian. I'm, I'm saying, can we at least try and agree on, on a reasonable approach for everyone? 
Yeah, so uh, for, as opposed to having to deal with you personally. So I don't know about everyone in the whole project, but the recommended approach for cigar architecture is the one I recommended, which is uh, try to get the, all the issues into some sub-projects project board, and then that sub-project has its own curation process for moving things through the different stages in their project boards. If you think an issue needs to get discussed soon, raise it on the SIG architecture mailing list. Uh, and if it doesn't get resolved there, then schedule it for a meeting. So that's, that's a recommended uh, approach for SIG architecture. And it, if people disagree with that, that's fine. But I think we should write that down as part of the just triage process and the issue life cycle. So I, just to riff a little bit on what Quentin was saying, I noodled around, but I've never really come up with something satisfying of some descriptive way for me to say, hey, here's my preferred contact mechanism. And to have one of the bots say, hey, it looks like you mentioned Thakin. Here's his preferred contact mechanisms, right? I, and I, I worry that, that like all the stuff you're ignoring will just DOS you if you do that. Um, maybe. I mean, like in these cases, there's, there's really two classes. Like I just get mentioned on a ton of things because apparently I talk a lot. Uh, and I also have people who are saying specifically like, can you look at this? And it, I, I, have a, I have a hope that if somebody got a message that said, here's Stockton's preferred contact mechanism, if you need him specifically to look at this PR, hit him on Slack, yeah. right? Uh, and it was just automatically posted every time somebody mentions me, like that would be great for me, maybe, or maybe it would just turn into another snowball. I, I don't leave really a know. status on your GitHub. Uh, yeah, but we, there's no, that doesn't translate I, that. I don't see the chat, but I think someone else wanted Sorry. to say something. Yeah, <clears throat> I just wanted to say that Christoph actually proposed something similar on the contributor experience list yesterday that you should check out if that's interesting to you, retying your GitHub status to automation and if you get, uh, if you get auto assigned as a reviewer and things like that. Oh, Christoph's on. Hey, Christoph. Shit, I'm sorry, I spoke for you. My bad. <laughs> no, that's, to that's totally okay. I was gonna, I was gonna speak up. So yeah, a couple, a couple things that I would, I would want to mention is, so, GitHub has something in between mention and assign, and that's a review request, and that's right. actually what our bot does when you go, when you slash cc somebody. That is a review request. Um, okay. So that. Sorry, what was that? That doesn't exist for issues. That exists for PRs. Sorry, you are you're correct. It doesn't exist for for uh, issues. It, it, it only exists on PRs. Also, um, as far as I know, that doesn't what? manifest in the email headers. Uh, but anyway, interesting. Go ahead. Continue, please. Sorry. One th one thing, like trying to handle some of the overload and ha trying to handle some of the the in particular PR review overload a feature that we've got that's like baking in Contribx right now I'm going to send it out to KDEV tomorrow and I'm hopefully turning it on next week is if you set a GitHub like busy status the bot will not try to assign new PRs to you for review um, you may still get suggested as an approver on PRs but as far as being like the first line reviewer on a PR it will skip over you for, for, for assigning if you have a busy status. There is opportunity to tie that U GitHub user status into more pieces in our automation. We'd want to be thoughtful about how we do it because we also don't want to flip on the other side where we're like spamming issues with like individual user statuses. Like I, I'm, I'm cognizant about not wanting to like post more things directly into issues and PRs because it can get spammy really quickly. But if we're thoughtful, there are other ways that we can kind of tie that GitHub user status into automation because it is an available thing in the API. And you can say like, hey, I have limited availability. I am busy. One, one thing that came up on a, a prow issue is, is like, if we could add it just a unique string to every type of notification the bot gave us, that would let us set up email filters. Like I would just love to have an email filter that deleted all test result emails because I really don't care about test results on things that I've reviewed. And it, it like it it's it sends like mul it bumps the thing to the top of my inbox multiple times uh, every time you push. So that would be super useful. 
we do that very inconsistently. There are a couple types of notifications that we actually do that because that allows the bot to identify the same type of comment and be able to edit it or clean it up. But it is a good suggestion that if we did that across the board for bot comments that, hey, if the bot comments on a thing, it uses this unique string that's like even just in an HTML comment so it's hidden from the UI, but it's something that is like searchable either through email or um, the API. That would be amazing. Like we used to do this for, for PR sizes. We used to put a comment that says, I'm calling this PR XL. And then I have, yeah, I have filters and labels for that. And then at some point we stopped doing that. I filed a bug on it, but nobody's been able to get back to it. So yeah. I'm going to time box that. I'm going to time box this and wrap it up. But if someone wants to help uh, document and involve the triage process itself, uh, Sid PM previously reached out about helping with uh, project management, curation, and SIG contributor experience is obviously working on this as well, and other SIGs are developing their own processes, so it'd be great if we had, uh, uh, like, I don't know that the processes need to be 100% consistent, but at least some known practices that work communicated across uh, the different SIGs that could be a recommended starting point. Uh, that would be great, and, you know, fixing some of the remaining issues that aren't quite ready, like the lack of subproject labels, the lack of the ability to, to get label, um, to know that from the list view that something is in a particular project board, uh, the ability to change titles uh, on the issues and things like that, uh, iron out those issues, document the process, at least that we use for cigar architecture. Uh, Brian, hi. Uh, so I had a question here uh, to the people who are on the call. Who wants to do this so we can try this a couple of times uh, every week? I mean, uh, every, every week we can try once. Uh, I know Valerie was interested. Is anybody else interested? Because I would like to like organize a session, uh, a half hour session every week where we do this uh, review so we can write things down and uh, you know, work out the kinks in the process. So uh, George is interested. George, can you add yourself uh, to the doc, please? Anybody else, uh, especially people who are usually quiet here uh, and not participate too much? Going once, going twice. Uh, back to you, Brian. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so again, with just 35 open issues, this is just Kubernetes, Kubernetes. I didn't show the community ones um, or the enhancement ones. Uh, I used to do this for the entire project way back when. Uh, definitely the larger volume you have, the more important it is that the process be efficient. Uh, also, the more people who are participating, the more important it is that there is some explicit indication on the issues about the disposition of that issue. Uh, so going to reliability specifically. So I talked about this at the Contributor Summit, quality being job one, uh, and mentioned a bunch of uh, issues relating to quality, uh, like correctness and scalability and, uh, and whatnot. Specifically, I wanna talk about reliability. Uh, reliability hasn't been really an explicit focus of the project. We don't have tests that are directly targeted towards reliability so much. We don't have a SIG of the kind of scalability that's horizontal focusing on reliability across the projects. Uh, I went, as part of this triage process, uh, after stumbling across this cascading failure one, I looked at related cascading failure issues and also reliability issues uh, generally. So, um, you know, if we look at area, Reliability. Uh, I actually added the reliability area to a few. I stumbled across it was removed it from some or closed some that were no longer relevant, uh, or asked if they could be closed because they seem stale. Um, but uh, so this is, is a handful. It almost certainly does not represent the full set of issues. But I think focusing on cascading. Um, Failure in particular, especially since it's been reported a couple of times publicly recently. Um, by the way, there's this, if you haven't seen this Kubernetes failure stories collection uh, that someone in the community is putting together, I recommend 
looking through it, this does list some of the cascading failure ones, like this one from, uh, by Target, which was actually more about their systems uh, failing than Kubernetes. But uh, for sure, you know, there are a lot of these million ways to crash your cluster, 100 ways to crash your, crash your cluster, et cetera, kinds of things that have been reported. Um, one, this came up in three different contexts this week. It came up in um, during this issue triage, it also came up in conformance, actually, because one thing that I observed in conformance is that there were end-to-end -end tests that were looking at very specific messages in, reported back as part of pods, uh, container status in the pod. And that seemed to be because uh, we were leaving broken containers that were never, ever going to work on the run, on the kubelets so that they wouldn't, uh, to work around the fact that um, if the kubelet killed them, the controllers would uh, recreate them immediately in a, in a somewhat hostile way, <laughs> in a tight loop, which, which is the purpose. So we seem to have, this has been rediscovered by several different people in several different contexts. Uh, so it was done with security context and uh, don't run this containers as root, and it was requesting root. It was done with app armor. It was done actually also with things like resource quota, uh, where we have a bunch of workarounds for the fact that the controller behavior is uh, doesn't degrade gracefully. Uh, so the pattern that seems to have evolved is uh, try to not make the controller think it has to recreate the pod. Uh, that's not really helpful because it hides a useful signal uh, to various things in the cluster. Uh, so I think we need a better solution to that. Um, but we should at least have agreements between workloads and node and scheduler. And you know, I don't know who officially owns. I think Signode owns the node controller as well. We own the node controller. Yeah. Uh, about what we think the pattern should be. And we should make sure that that is clearly indicated through uh, a status field and some resource that can be depended upon by clients in, in conformance tests. And right now, we do not have that. Um, Ryan, it, it sounds like there's two dis sort of distinct areas here. The one is the one is the stability of the Kubernetes infrastructure, uh, you know, crashing whole cluster and those issues you mentioned. The other one is is application stability and some of which is uh, affected by how Kubernetes manages containers. Are, are you wanting to tackle both of those areas or, or one more than the other? Um, I'm referring to the former right now, the stability of the cluster itself, uh, which can be impacted by things like uh, can pods being repeatedly killed and recreated or containers crash looping and filling up local disks, which causes nodes to fail and you know pods getting created and killing other nodes. Okay, makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so you know there are a couple of different ways we could tackle it. If we don't have critical mass for uh, a bigger effort, we could just have a discussion amongst the relevant SIGs and come up with a plan for uh, what to do. You know, there are different levels of uh, kind of effort and organization we could put into this right now. I think, you know, at, at least right now, making for SIGs that I know are working on reliability efforts like SIG API machinery, I know is working on rate limiting and preventing uh, DOS of API server, and SIG node is working on uh, some reliability efforts. Uh, as well, at least come up with a common way of surfacing those things, such as with the reliability uh, label or, you know, having just communicating across the different SIGs what's going on. Uh, that would be a good starting point with the cascading deletion in particular. I'd like to have an agreement on how the control loops should interact so that we can make sure that we have a clear contract between the different components about how to respond. Uh, as opposed to having everybody kind of sort of re rediscover the same problem and work around it and sometimes in similar ways and sometimes in different ways, but in ways that have 
uh, unfortunate consequences in other contexts. Um, like, you know, I, I came, when I was reading through failure stories, I also came across reports of users finding these dead pods on their nodes and writing controllers to go kill them. Uh, so that's not really an ideal uh, solution. Uh, so do, do people have thoughts on how we want to try to tackle this right now? Ken, Ken has his hand up. I can't see other people on the screen if they. So I think some of these are actually like for uh, pod security context, for instance, right? Like I don't think the workloads controller should be involved in that loop in particular. The scheduler shouldn't place things on nodes where it can't possibly schedule. For things that are going to crash loop back off, we could probably be more sensitive there, right? Like if it's continuously crashing, then we could find a way to make sure that the workloads controllers implement even more of a back off than they already do to try to stop launching pods that we know are not going to ever, ever work. Um, the finicky bit there is that, so if the user goes and updates it, right, then what do we do there? Um, we consider that effectively a new deployment with a new UUID, or actually in this case, replica set with new UUID, and we ignore all prior history. Good question. So it, it, these kinds of good questions. I think, I think so I don't actually want to design the solution here. Um, it's more of one approach is we could get someone to volunteer to own it and assign the issue to them and they can make a proposal and the, um, you know, two or three SIGs that are involved can review the proposal. Uh, that would be one approach. The other is we could, you know, schedule another meeting specifically about this to brainstorm solutions and to, yeah, I mean, that's more of less what I ask is how do we want to tackle the, Do we have point? anyone from scheduling yeah, here? This, this is a complex problem, actually. We, we cannot simply just avoid rescheduling these kind of parts. But yeah, uh, we, need, we need more more discussion about this. We, we, we had thought about this, but uh, the solution is not that simple. No, like, especially for the security context, there's no telemetry from Node to let the scheduler know that it can't even place the pod there right now, right? So like, yeah, you're not aware of it. And there's, there's lots of issues like that. But if we're just looking to come up with the broad strokes of how we're going to approach the problem, I would suggest that we get um, leads from SIG node, SIG scheduling, and uh, SIG. Well, I, so, yeah, so I guess one first step would be to take what I did and go a little bit farther, which is to go through the set of issues that we've tracked down and, and try to categorize what the different sources of problems are. Uh, so we, we can at least all have a common understanding of the current situation. Okay. And then we can, if more information needs to get surfaced from the nodes or we need to change the workload controller behavior or we need to change the scheduler behavior, then we can start to have that discussion. Um, so at least having someone go through more comprehensively and write up a summary of the set of issues would be good. There's sort of a partial one in uh, this one, but it's just partial. Uh, like it doesn't mention the ones that have already been worked around, like the App Armor one. Uh, I personally think it's actually perfect to should have the SIG app capture because the signal the pre proposed this is quite probably from the 1.0, even before one from Fraser, they Daniel and I discussed. There is the many proposal come from right. the signal. And so yeah, this issue is from 2014. Yes, uh, but actually we have the even like before 1.0 GKE, uh, not GKE, Kubernetes release, we already yeah. uh, noticed those problems. We try to work in policy for the cluster level. Like, the, okay, there's a many proposal. One proposal like a maximum senior account. So we have all those kind of the, for the per job or per uh, work node. So a lot of proposal, but that's in require of the beyond signal. So we basically add the throttle on the failure on the node, the crash and the back off on the node, but uh, there are some more things on the controller. There are also like the things on the scanner give the signal. So that's actually this one really perfect it should be signal architecture. We could help you guys to have the policy at the class level at particularly different of controller and also the particularly different of the work node. We could have the pop, but we should all agree from the overall community. So not just signal though. So the, basically, so that's why I think about the signal architecture. Right. They also have the API. Yeah, so in terms of, I agree, it's not just one SIG, which is why I asked folks from multiple SIGs to attend this meeting. Uh, but what we need is like specific people yes. to actually ch chase this down. Yeah, uh, I'm kind of interested. I, I have 
almost no time, but I'm, I'm kind of interested, uh, especially to see if there's any way of applying the, uh, the sort of rate limiting uh, design that we've got in progress for uh, like regular API, API server queries. Okay. It would be interesting if we could uh, expand that uh, to rate limit the creation of pods. Yeah, and one issue that's been raised is uh, how hard it would be. Uh, and again, if people are raising their hand or something in chat, I can't see that. So if someone can moderate and uh, interject, that would be great. Um, but yeah, so one of these issues had a specific proposal for a gen generic rate limiter uh, that thir even third party like operators and, and mm -hmm. workload controllers could use, not just the built in ones, because like DemonSet has a workaround in DemonSet for a specific scenario, but that didn't get into the other even built in workload yes. controllers. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, I don't know if it's fair to make every controller uh, collectively implement a rate limit. Yeah. So was there someone? Well, uh, someone else? Uh, uh, Aaron had. We're saying something. Yeah, I was about to suggest that that this seems like a big enough problem that we we want to actually formally get a working group together. It's one of these things that we've started trying to solve so many times, um, but if we actually put a working group together and people who actually have time and and set a clear set of goals and a timeline. Uh, we maybe have a better chance of um, succeeding. I actually think, I don't know if a whole group, if we just had one person <laughs> to go and just look down, like I said, and, and write a summary of what the problems and the workarounds have been, I think that would be a good starting point. Uh, like I, I don't necessarily think there needs to be more meetings. We need to categorize a set of problems, then there will need to be a proposal to address them, and then there will need to be reviews of that proposal. Uh, if we were wanted to tackle reliability more broadly than the, this one issue, then I would agree. And then some sort of working group or SIG or something might be desirable. But I don't know, if we can't even get one person to volunteer to do this, I don't know that I would suggest we go that route. So I think, I'm not sure that I'm convinced that this is one issue. Like, I think there are several different issues here that would call it, that potentially would call for several different solutions. Not that I'm opposed to the idea of somebody just cataloging tight looping in general, right? Like that sounds like a reasonable thing to do and start off with like what's wrong, then figure out, you know, what we should do. Sounds like a reasonable first step. And I don't, I agree. I don't think we need a whole group of people to do it. Yeah. I, I think this is somebody, the right person could do this in like one day if they had one day. Uh, that, that's fine. I mean, I think if the, if the working group is one person and, and, uh, uh, a sustainable process comes out of it that that's totally fine process so we to be clear the output that we're looking for here is a, a categorization of issues related to type looping and basically a list and then from there we would go and figure out who should be responsible in terms of coming up with proposals for how to address those either as a group or individually and then yeah. from there we would figure out like when yeah, we specifically do. pod uh, tight looping in the pod life cycle, right? Pod container and pod life cycle. So I just constrain this to that first because that's the most common scenario that I see. I can go do a list. That's not the big, that big of a deal. Can, uh, can, uh, sorry, I had, a, I had a slightly different question, which is, which I thought was your original question, Brian, which is, is this area of reliability big and important enough that we actually need? Uh, something bigger than a single effort to solve this particular problem, uh, be that a SIG or a sub-project of, of, uh, of this SIG or, or a working group or something else? Um, or do we just leave it as it is at the moment where kind of all the SIGs collectively try and make stuff reliable and empirically don't seem to be very successful at it? Uh, yes, that was something I was also getting at. I, I personally think it is big enough. I am uh, concerned about whether we could stop it, uh, but I, I do think it is big enough. For example, uh, the scalability at SIG created uh, CubeMark to do some benchmarking. I could easily see a reliability SIG creating a variety of chaos tests, stress tests, and things like that to help bulletproof the system better. Like just deploy a crash looping pod with a daemon set 
across all the nodes of a large cluster and see what happens, right? Like we should have. I totally agree with you. Uh, and, and I guess the question is, do we want that to be a completely self-standing SIG or do we want to, that to be a sub-project of, of uh, this SIG architecture? I, I don't feel strongly either way, but it seems yeah, like I, a reasonable question. I don't feel strongly either. I think it depends on how many, the scale of the effort. And it can change over time. Like it can start as an informal group and become, you know, a sub project or working group or whatever and, and evolve into a SIG, that would be fine. I don't, I don't think the problem will go away. So I think a standing body of some sort rather than a working group is eventually what we want. Uh, I I'm just don't know how quickly we can get critical mass on it. I think starting off as a, as a semi-formal group in this group, subgroup of this group, whatever we call it, a sub project or a working group or something would be a great starting point um, and okay. it would help us to get some staff. I just want to say that no matter what format it is for the real ability, signal is definitely one of the process. Okay. We, every quarter, we have to specify always every quarter we have a real ability enhancement on the signal. So if we, we have that to cross her rental effort, no matter what format, signal want to participate that and based on that cross her rental goal to base a, and to put off the priority based on those kind of things. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so let's figure that out. Let's take that to the mailing list uh, and see how others feel about subproject versus other type of, of subgroup and see if we can get uh, some wood behind this arrow. Um, we're about out of time, so I did want to move on uh, to quick sub-project updates. API reviews, Jordan? Um, They're making progress. Uh, we are um, scheduling actual meetings to go through things, or at least I am for mine. I found that is helpful. Get some on the calendar, get some uh, ordered. Um, if you have questions, you can look in the project board to see where yours is. If it is sitting in an unassigned column, uh, feel free to reach out to the people in the owner's aliases for the relevant things to get the owners assigned, reviewers assigned. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, conformance, Tim? Uh, it's been delightfully boring. Uh, we've just been trucking away against the PRs that have been coming in. Uh, there is one cap that John had proposed that I think holds a lot of promise to help uh, federate some of the work and give us a way of prioritizing uh, what we think is important in the long term. But I do think it needs a revision. Uh, so maybe once it's been revised, we can maybe publicize that a little bit more broadly to get some feedback. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Srini has been working on bot automation to help uh, do our triage process a little bit cleaner. Cool. And code organization, Dims? Uh, so we have we had been trying to prune uh, dependencies. Uh, so we have a few people looking at different options. We were able to make uh, a few changes already, uh, and some others are in progress. Uh, we are trying to switch gears now, trying to see if uh, see what else we could do around, um, like give a specific theme to a, a specific meeting and say, can, oh, can we talk about feature uh, branches or can we talk about how, you know, what are the options we have for moving code around, um, things like that. So we are going to switch to that format now and see what comes out of that. Okay. Uh, and I guess last item on the agenda, uh, rewards and recognition tied to owner's files, Ms. Paris on? I am on and I'm gonna make it super quick. All I need is your expertise and uh, awesome counsel from this group uh, because you all are approvers and reviewers. Uh, we, I was thinking about an idea where we could uh, serve important information, congratulations, swag, et cetera, to people who get put into owner's files. Uh, just so that we could deal with some of the discoverability informations and things like that that we have uh, and uh, serve them like mentoring opportunities and things like that. So if you have any uh, ideas, uh, feel free to comment, especially ideas without wanting to do any work. That's totally fine too. Uh, just insert on the, uh, on the link there. That's it for me. Thanks.
Okay, thanks. And a quick announcement, uh, the, next, the meetings during KubeCon are canceled. So if you're at KubeCon, uh, enjoy it. If you're not, uh, enjoy the work time. Uh, so that's it. Thanks everybody very much. Uh, definitely, if you have issues to discuss with Cigar Architecture, use the mailing list. It is the best format for long form discussion. If you just have a question, uh, feel free to try Slack. Uh, see everybody in, I guess, uh, three or four weeks. Happy Thursday.